berry crops on this Farm to Fork Wyoming. Production of Farm to Fork Wyoming is made possible with the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you. Berry lovers would be heartened to know that in Wyoming's windy, harsh climate, even the sweetest, most delicate of things can grow. Thanks to some undaunted farmers, sizable berry patches bloom each year here in Wyoming. Probably total in berries about a half acre. For Leroy John's half acre outside of Wheatland, it's about exploring what's possible. We've got 13 different varieties of red raspberries, just to find out which ones are more disease prone, which ones. From numerous varieties of raspberries and blackberries. Best crop of blackberries we've ever had. To some seldom encountered exotics that just might remain that way. This is the aronia. Okay. The so, chokeberry. Yeah. They're not they... bad. You know, I like them, but it's not one of those you're going to take to the farmer's market and sell them, I don't no, think. I... They're highly nutritious. Um, some of these plants might be more popular as ornamentals. This is the goji berry. Oh, and it's still blooming. This is a second crop, like eating fresh peas with an aftertaste. Yeah. Like it does kind of peas. taste like that. Yeah. And we sell those at the farmer's market. I like it in a salad. Um, here's your elderberry. They don't have a lot of flavor, but my wife made some uh, elderberry syrup. Oh boy, it tastes almost like blueberry. These are the yellow raspberries. These are, oh. these are way past prime, obviously. Okay. You have to pick those every day. So we had boysenberry this year. And again, they're kind of a thorny bugger. They're, I bought some welding gloves or sleeves to pick those with. Where Leroy explores the spectrum, growers like Sun Harvest and Raspberry Delight run more production-focused raspberry patches. But this one is called Caroline. This is a favorite. And this is our favorite plant. It's our biggest producer. It's what our new plants are also mm. because mm -hmm. it puts on tons. But when it comes to sheer volume in Wyoming, Greg Jarvis is the king of raspberries. We were producing over 30,000 pounds of berries out of those two acres. With over 600 acres in production, Greg Jarvis is no stranger to the economic challenges of agriculture. Uh, 1998, we were still getting the same price for our hay and stuff that we were getting when I started back in 1974. So we started looking into raspberries then. And so I did tons of research on the internet. And in 99, we planted the, the first two acres and 2,200 plants to the acre. It was a real cool, wet spring. and shoot every raspberry came up. We're going, wow, these things are easy to raise. <laughs> With a 98% survival rate, expansion seemed like a good idea. The spring of 2000, we hooked onto these rows and we we're gonna plant two more acres below. We ordered the plants that came in, got them planted, and 2000 was the beginning of the drought for us. And it was hot, dry, no rain and we had a 98% death loss. We only had about 2% of them left. So with the first two acres still standing, they built a small industry as the humbling seven-year drought brought the family cattle operation to a close. Well, there was only two acres of raspberries and they take a lot of water, but, but it's only two acres, so we'd save enough water so we could keep the raspberries irrigated and we'd usually get the alfalfa hay irrigated once. So when they were talking about making us pull off the pasture, we didn't have anywhere to go with the cows. We had to bring them in and feed them hay. We sold them in 2001. And then the raspberries started kicking in. And so they kind of bailed us out. For the piles, raspberries have also proved successful on limited resources. The size of our parcel here has determined what we can grow on it. The raspberries are perfect for that because you only need an acre or two to be well supplied with berries during their season. But finding profits, let alone a market, is a great challenge. Corporate chains manage regional inventories through central distribution centers 
making small-scale local sourcing impractical. We, we checked on selling on the raspberries in the grocery store, and they had to go to Denver first to the warehouse and then come back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. We want to keep them fresh. <laughs> At that point, we just decided we, we were going to direct market everything, so we learned a lot about marketing real fast. Especially when you're street marketing, you have big signs and, and stuff that waves around so the people, it'll get your attention. Fortunately, the farmer's markets were starting to take off. It was a lot of work. We'd uh, leave here at 10 o'clock on Thursday morning, go to Lander, set up, sell till I eat, get home like at 9. Like a year or two later, Laramie started their farmer's market and we participated in that one. And get up the next morning, start loading the trailer at 7 and head for Laramie and we couldn't haul enough berries down there. The piles have also become experts in self-distribution. Every day is different. Um, we have several markets, some that go to Jackson Hole. Some containers go to Warlands, which actually then get sent on to Billings. Um, and then we, we really love to cover our farmers markets around Fremont County. So we, we sell in Lander, we sell in Riverton, we sell in Casper um, at the farmers markets. And we just package those according to what we need for which person is getting our berries. And then of course we also sell right off the farm quite a bit. Living just outside of Riverton, they invite you pig visitors to the farm and that keeps them connected to their neighbors. We have kids coming from schools and we have groups coming and it is a joy. It is so much fun to be there when all of that's going on. Jarvis's do the same. But unlike pumpkins and other crops you replant each year, raspberries are a long-term commitment. They had a life cycle of about 12 to 15 years mm. and we're on seven, year 17 this year. so. In order to withstand Wyoming winters, fall-bearing varieties that die back each year to the ground are the key. So this is all new growth, regrowth that you see here. Summer berries, which are a whole different management than fall berries. Summer berries you get in the middle of the summer and it's a wonderful time to have raspberries, but then what you have to do to get berries every year is go through acres, however much you have, and cut out every cane that bore fruit. Oh. And <clears throat> that isn't a management thing that my husband and I can manage. We just can't mm. get to that. Yeah. But these, we don't, we don't worry. Now, if we had summer berries, a big concern, and probably more so for a home grower rather than a commercial grower, are deer eating them. Oh. Because when the deer devour the canes and they love them, you wouldn't think with the thorns they'd love them, but they do, then you end up losing a lot of your crop. So mm -hmm. we buy and we raise and grow fall berries. They grow up every year. We cut them off in the spring, early, early spring, like okay. February, March, and then they grow up a brand new Okay, hedge. so they've got all summer to grow a new cane and then Right, and put on fruit, the right. The trade-off is a later starting berry harvest. They usually come off oh, between the 1st and the 15th of August. They start and they're ever bearing, so they continue bearing, continue bearing until we get freeze, mm -hmm. a hard freeze, about 25, 26 degrees. But the Wyoming wind is the most reliable mid-season menace. Just destroys these berries for about two days oh. till we get all those soft ones picked off. All these varieties are like semi-thornless. Mm. And you'll see they have a little short thorn, just really short. They'll rub against each other when wind's blowing. It looks like somebody got murdered out here. <laughs> it's just red all up and down the rows and on the ground. <laughs> and when it comes to picking, raspberries may be the most labor-intensive crop in the state. The peak of the raspberries when they were producing so much there in, oh, like 2004, five, six, seven, we were running about 12 pickers every day. We had 12 pickers to keep up. And they were cranking out, oh, six to 800 pounds of berries a day. Six days a week for each two pickers in the field. I need one lady in the packing barn packing the raspberries, mm -hmm. sorting and packing. Yeah. And so we needed like six people in there. 
Like the rest of the country, Wyoming cannot bring in a seasonal harvest without migrant labor. We definitely need the migrant workers because we can't find anybody here that will do the hand labor and stuff like that. You know, they don't, they just don't want to do it. You have to be quick enough to make it worth your while. For some people just starting out, um, the money may not be worth the heat and the bees and whatever else they encounter out here. I tried the college kids at CWC and it was okay, but it just, they couldn't get enough hours in. And you picking is more of a social benefit than a practical solution. And that is what this little patch will be designed for is our pick your owners so that we're not competing our pick your owners with our mm -hmm. other, you know, our production. Mm -hmm. yeah. Visiting pickers don't clean the rows off as thoroughly as the grower needs. And coming in after the U pickers only makes the production pickers job more difficult. Because other, otherwise we do kind of go into each other's territory and we don't want that to happen. We really want to be able to supply what we need for our, our custom pickers. Fortunately for the piles, they've struck a good arrangement with Pablo. And Pablo is one of the best pickers that we've ever seen. In fact, he showed up at our farm probably 15 years ago and we were thinking we would need to show him what to do and he took off. <laughs> we realized we don't know how to pick raspberries. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a learning experience for us, not for him. Yeah. And we have just enjoyed him. Every year he's come back. Yeah. Um, and Gabriella is phenomenal also. So, and she's a new addition to our, our farm because he married her, I think, just a few years back. So she's a wonderful, wonderful person and, and a fantastic picker, which we really need. And the Jarvises also have a long-standing relationship with Raphael's family. Yo tengo 16 años. 16, 16 years. Oh, wow. This. Yeah, picking every year, every year. Rafael feels Wyoming is a healthy change from the California Central Valley he calls home. Bueno, esta fruta no la spraya. Like the raspberry, they don't spray it at all, it's just no. natural. Todo el tiempo lo, lo le. Like every time, yeah, like bueno. all the time in California, you get really itchy and. Por eso el estado de Wyoming es bonito porque no hay. He said Wyoming's like a little bit cleaner than in California because there's not as they don't use as much chemicals on their fruits and stuff. And there's another labor force making a big difference on these farms. Like 10 o'clock in the morning, it sounds like the field's gonna fly off. There's so many bees out there. Beehives are a huge benefit. We partner with Wind River Honey. They had them on the alfalfa, and the closest ones were about three quarters of a mile away. And when we planted the raspberries, you'd see the bees here, but not tons of them, I'm afraid. So I talked to Larry that one day when he was out here, and he said, well, next year we'll just bring out 16 hives and set them right there on the raspberry field. And when he did that, it almost doubled the production. And while 98% of our insect friends bring benefits, a few troublemakers have found their way into Wyoming. Oh, we've had insect problems, and it seems like they're getting to be more and more, and I don't know whether it's because we've had the raspberries long enough now, you know, that different pests have moved in. But. Avoiding pesticides is the goal, but there are times when there seem no reasonable alternatives. Every year is different, you know. Uh, one year we had a little green caterpillar, Mm -hmm. And it was before we had berries or blossoms on the plants, but they had devoured the leaves and we were afraid, really afraid, that we were going to lose our whole crop to them. That was the fifth or sixth year that we grew raspberry, so it was long ago. Uh -huh. But um, we did spray our plants and uh, with seven, and mm -hmm. because there were no blossoms, we felt like that was fairly safe. And it, that was the only year we've ever put anything on our plants. I've never seen them since. I've seen one here, maybe one there, but it was just an infestation of them. It was just a year for the little green inchworm. But yeah. we, it was a matter of losing everything, right. you know? And so you have to make decisions sometimes that you don't like, Yeah. but your livelihood is at stake. And recent years have brought one of the most challenging invaders yet. The Drosophilia, that thing has been killing us. It came from Japan and it spread all across the lower 48 in just a little over a year. What's bad about the spotted wing Drosophilia, it has a sawtooth ovid depositor where they lay their eggs. So they can actually saw into that drupelet on the berry, but they just turn the berries off and just ruin the fruit. Here's what the spotted wing fruit fly looks like. 
And this is what you end up with the next day, and it'll look just like that. Temperatures seem to be a major driver in fruit fly outbreaks. Generally, they, they like between 70 and 90. Mm. Anything over that, the male becomes sterile. Anything under oh. 70, they just, you know, they're not very productive. During the worst outbreaks early on, pesticides seem the only option. When we first had them, I don't know, about four years ago, we tried the spraying and, and it, it kind of worked, but it just, you had to do it every three days because the life cycle's three days. You gotta keep spraying them until you finally break that cycle. Even with pesticides, there is no cheap, easy answer. The stuff that I bought is Delegate, which is, it's, it's the same, same family, but it's not organic labeled. It was $200 for 28 ounces, so it's about $7, $8 an ounce. In the last four years, the Jarvises have opted not to spray at all. Raspberries are, well, are just like little sponges, so you can't really spray anything on them. Mm. There's a few things you can spray on them. There's pyrethrins, which are supposed to be really safe and stuff, but then you have to be careful of the bees. An organic form of pyrethrin has been derived from the chrysanthemum seed for thousands of years. While this natural form breaks down easily, pyrethrins attack the nervous system of a broad spectrum of creatures, ranging from fish to insects, and especially affecting bees. We have 16 beehives, so if you do spray anything to control anything, you have to do it at night, so the bees have gone to bed. And Alternatives to spraying have been the focus of our Wyoming producers. Well, the trapping is, is you know, is, is, is a way of trying to keep a handle on it. I've got probably about 50 of these traps, uh, or maybe even probably close to 80. And the idea is just to, you know, trap as many as we can. The most effective method is labor intensive, but has worked well for the piles. They like uh, overripe fruit. So oh. one of the management tools that we have is to pick our fruit clean, as yeah. clean as we can pick it. Always, always make sure it's all off there, all of our good fruit. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a few other things that we do. One of the things is that we bring our temperatures in our cooler down to 32 degrees, mm -hmm. which is the nip of frost in there. You know, So when we pick and produce and put our fruit into our cooler, we know that it is going to actually nip anything that might be there. That, and when we work our raspberries in our workroom, we make sure that there is not a single berry that's left overnight. Mm -hmm. Anything that we don't want, like this one that's been eaten, mm -hmm. we put them in um, Ziploc baggies and we make sure that they're sealed and nothing gets oh, into them, mistake. nothing gets out. We don't give the fruit flies an opportunity to reproduce in anything wow. in our workspace. You know, and it's not to say that it couldn't resurge, yeah. Because pests it's do. There. We have grasshoppers. We contend with grasshoppers all the time. Yeah. You know, we just have to plant enough that they can have their portion and we can have our portion. What's new um, as far as pest control this year? Um, we noticed it last year, but we also notice it in greater quantities this year are wasps. Oh, yeah. And they are a pest. And they also eat the bottoms out of our berries. So now there's a new pest. But unbothered by any of these problems, Chris Silver has been happily picking his strawberries in a Laramie hoop house. I've actually seen flowers in this high tunnel in February. <gasps> when it's you know 20 degrees outside and the wind's blowing and there's snow on the ground, I walk in here and I see green plants with flowers on them. I start picking these strawberries in May, and can, in the last two years, I've picked the, last, the week before Thanksgiving. Chris is in his third year of a productivity trial for the University of Wyoming. The idea behind the project was we were gonna compare yields of high tunnel production, strawberry production, versus greenhouse production using a hydroponic growing system. Now, the, the hydroponic growing was a complete failure, but the high tunnel production has been a huge success. Oh, and, and so uh, this is the third year of, of this particular strawberry patch. Three years is sort of the industry standard. After about three years, insects, diseases um, start to spread 
spread and the yields really start to decline. Like raspberries, strawberries are perennial and come in three different fruit-bearing varieties. They're June-bearing strawberries and as the name suggests, they produce strawberries in June. Um, and, but, and they only produce one crop per year. Those types of strawberries can be very productive, but given the weather that we have in Wyoming in June means that there's a good chance we could get freezing temperatures, snowfall, that could completely wipe out that crop. Other varieties uh, include day neutral and ever bearing type strawberries. And those give you a little more flexibility because they'll produce over the course of the, the growing season. So this particular variety that I'm looking at is called Seascape. It's a, it's a day neutral variety. And, and once we start getting nights, uh, nighttime temperatures that remain above freezing, we'll start getting strawberry production. And putting these plants under a high tunnel extends their growing season by at least one climate zone. Uh, this Earlier this year we had a snow in late May and I was already picking strawberries uh, and, and then the last two years I've been picking well into November at, you know and last year we had our first freeze in August mm -hmm. so August September October you know I got three months just on the tail end of the season last year yeah. so the the high tunnels really do make sense for uh, a day neutral uh, type strawberry that's going to produce through the whole growing season besides the season extension benefit yeah you've got uh, the benefit of protecting your plants from the wind, which is a huge problem in growing anything in Wyoming. You know, deer, mice. Oh, now here's one that looks like a mouse nibbled on. There's another one. Uh, birds, you know, they all like to eat strawberries too. I grew the same variety in my backyard and the birds would get to them before I would. And the ventilation design of the high tunnel is important. I like the design of this high tunnel because it has walls that come up uh, about three feet and then open up. If they roll up from the ground, any, any critter could just wander right in. Plus, the, the wind is going to blow right through there. But that is not to say that these high tunnels don't get visitors. Anytime you're growing in a closed environment like this, if you have an insect problem or a disease problem, it can become widespread in a short period of time. You really have to be diligent. But we get slugs and um, the what well, we call them the roly-polies, the, the pill bugs. That's the type of damage those pill bugs do. And those are probably the worst two pests that I have in this tunnel. Pre-planting preparations bring benefits as well. We amended the soil first. We, we installed drip irrigation lines and then we put um, this weed fabric down mm -hmm. and the weed fabric helps keep the weeds down obviously um, but also keeps the one of the problems you can get with the the fruit if it's laying on the soil can start to rot so mm -hmm. it's actually sitting on something that keeps the fruit clean too so with strawberries really any type of berries uh, fertility is is crucial. Uh, these plants need water and nutrients. So I water two to three times a week with drip irrigation and I fertilize with iron uh, because we do have alkaline soils here which are common throughout much of Wyoming. You'll see um, leaves that have yellow um, leaf tissue with green veins and that's a sign of iron deficiency or iron chlorosis in plants. Um, so basically as the pH increases or alkalinity uh, of the soil increases, iron becomes less available to the plants. Mm. It's a clay loam uh, out here and it's got a pH of about 7.7. The, the long-term solution to that is to amend the soil and adjust the pH, but that's really difficult to do. So the short-term fix is to use a granular or a chelated iron and uh, fertilize your plants with that. I've, I've fertilized with iron twice this year, uh, actually twice every year uh, mm -hmm. since we've had the strawberries, and I fertilize with nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and organic um, general fertilizer. Uh, two or three times um, over, the, over the course of the growing season. Chris sees pest and weed control going hand in hand in the high tunnel. 
we've done everything we can to keep the weeds down. We don't like to spray chemicals. We've tried um, every organic approach uh, possible from the weed, uh, the weed fabric to you know pulling weeds instead of spraying weeds, planting densely, and that sort of thing. But one of the things I've noticed is that when the weeds do get a little out of hand, that's when I start to notice more slug problems, disease problems on the fruit and, and, on the, and on the plants. And so just keeping the weeds down seems to make a, a huge difference. After three seasons, the return has been pretty gratifying. The first two years, I, I harvested about 250 pounds, and so about $1,000 worth of strawberries off of a $75 investment. Mm -hmm. that, that's, of course, ignoring all the other costs that, yeah. that went into it. And so, I mean, the cost of the high tunnel um, was roughly $1,000. Um, it costs me about fifty to sixty dollars to fertilize every time I fertilize here for the mm. to, to buy the iron product and then the general fertilizer, um, and and then the the drip irrigation and the weed fabric were the other expenses. So you know they're they're great for the backyard gardener who just wants something fresh uh, that they've grown that tastes good. Strawberries are a great candidate. If you're growing for a market, this is something that you could um, you could diversify your production system. You know, continue to grow your tomatoes and lettuce and, and green beans and all of those other great vegetables. But this is something that your customers will seek out at the farmers market. If Wyoming farmers can turn a profit on something as delicate as a raspberry, anything seems possible. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. This episode of Farm to Fork Wyoming is available for $25. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org.